Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to my first recorded lecture for um, this is the recorded lecture for Mon or excuse me, Tuesday, 3 1. Um, I'm going to pick up where we left off on Thursday. Um, and I'll start out, first of all, with um, going to our whiteboard to go over the homework that you guys have due this week. So let's move over here. So this is for week seven. So our homework is the chapter seven study module. Oops, sorry, study module. And this is due on Monday. And I have that as 3-7. And then you also have your Serigo check-in. This is Serigo check-in, I believe, number two. This is also due on Monday, 3-7. And for the levels that you're expected to be at, we have chapters one and two, and that should be at a level 3.0. For chapters three and four, you should be at a 2.5, chapter five at a 2.0, chapter six, which we should be starting today at a 1.5, and then chapter seven, you should be at a 1.0. And please keep in mind that chapter seven, there are two vocabulary sets, okay? Also, one thing that I wanted to point out is that we are going to have exam two in uh, week eight, which is the week that I will be back. And so I'm going to make sure that that's up here. So just so you can keep that in mind, the outline is already in Blackboard under the exam review outlines. So exam two, and this will cover chapters five, six, and seven. This one will open on Thursday at 5 p.m. Sorry, I guess I should rewrite that. That's a little bit confusing. So how about if we say opens at 5 p.m. and that's Thursday, the 10th of March. And then this will close at 5 p.m. and that will be Saturday, the 12th. Um, we should be able to get through chapter seven by then, so please don't be concerned about that. Um, today's lecture, I should complete chapter five and get a good way through chapter six. My second recorded uh, lecture should complete chapter six and likely get a start on chapter seven. And then we can finish chapter seven when I come back on uh, what would be the eighth, I believe. That would be the date that I would be back. Um, Hopefully, if you have any questions, please do reach out to Alden. You are also welcome to send me an email. Just know that I may not be as quick to respond um, directly after my surgery. But this is really the homework that you have due. Um, and then what I would like to start talking about um, is we have been working on, we've been talking about uh, mutations is where we left off last week. So mutations. And I want you to keep in mind that when we talk about mutations, we're looking at changes in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. And one of the things that hopefully you saw not only through the chapter, but also through that um, little exercise we did, that protein synthesis activity, is that you really saw that anything that happens, oops, sorry, I forgot any there. Um, anything that happens at that DNA level. So if we were to swap out an A, T, C, or G for a different nucleotide at that level or different base, we would then see that the mRNA would be changed, which means the codon would look different. So a different anti-codon would recognize it, which means likely a different amino acid might be added to the protein. And so we think of these mutations of these changes at the DNA sequence, but these can have real consequences when we start thinking about the product of a particular gene. And so um, I'm gonna jump us back and kind of talk about this a little bit, um, talking about these mutations. But the first thing that I wanted to talk about was we had these three broad, types. And we thought of those, the first one being what we called a substitution. And a substitution just means that a base is substituted 
with a different base. So just one base is changed. The other types that we had was we talked about, the second type that we had was what we called an insertion. And this means the insertion of one or more nucleotides in the DNA sequence. And this is a really good um, exercise to go back and look at that protein synthesis activity that we talked about and think about what would happen if on that DNA sentence that you rewrote onto your worksheet, if you'd substituted, right, an A for a T, for example, or a C for a T, what that would look like down um, throughout that process getting to the protein. And insertion also, you can think about if when you were writing down that DNA sentence, you by accident added in an extra either A, T, C, or G, what that might do for your mRNA and your tRNA and ultimately your protein. And then the last of kind of these three broad types of, of mutations is a deletion. And a deletion in this case, um, when we think about um, a deletion, we're really thinking about, oops, sorry, let me make sure I'm back where I was. Um, a deletion is really where we have the deletion of one or more nucle nucleotides as well, right? And so again, that would be as though when you wrote out your DNA sentence that maybe you left out a letter. And so if I, if you think about that, and I can pull out one of our um, example worksheets when we thought about this, let me see if I can find that. Um, one of the things that I want you to think about when we think of these sentences, so if we think about these broad types, most of you chose sentence number two. So let's say the DNA number two from um, activity, you can kind of see that um, what should have been the original, so the original DNA was at least the start was CTA, TTA, CGA, and then ACT. And what I'm really talking about here, so a substitution would mean maybe we went in here and we didn't have an A here, maybe we had a G. Well, as you go down and you look at the mRNA that you would um, make that's complementary to that, or the um, tRNA and the anticodon, you may end up with a completely different amino acid, or in the case of our activity, a completely different letter. So that's one way that we could have something that's different. Going back, if this is our original again, right, which was the CTA, I also want you to think about what would happen if we inserted an amino acid. And so maybe we inserted by accident when you're copying it, right, which is what happens in DNA replication, maybe by accident, you put in an extra A here. What I want you to think about is how we read these. We read these in triplets, right? And now what we've done is we have shifted our reading frame, which means that we are seeing completely different, we would have completely different codons from whenever we had that insertion. And that would be true with the deletion as well is that it would shift back. And so we'll talk about these. These kind of um, mutations are called frame shift and they basically change that reading frame. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna walk through some of these different kinds of specific um, mutations so that you guys have an idea. And then um, kind of think about that as you look back on the activity that we did. So I'm gonna go back to where we left off on Thursday. That was right here where we were talking about these different types of mutations. So I'm gonna walk through each of these, but I do want you to be mindful of the fact that mutations can be helpful. Perhaps they make that protein work more efficiently. Detrimental, meaning that that protein is no longer functional and that that harms the organism. Or they could be neutral, meaning that the change that happens doesn't actually affect the protein's um, function. So as I said, there's these five specific ones that we're gonna look at. So the first of these is what we call a silent mutation. And a silent mutation, there still is a change of the DNA sequence, 
but it's in one of those places where ultimately the amino acid remains the same. And that's usually due to that redundancy where we had multiple codons that could code for the same amino acid. So silent mutation, the protein is gonna look normal, but if we looked at the DNA level, there would be a mutation. The next type of mutation that we wanna talk about is what is called a reversion mutation. And this occurs when that base substitution um, is actually corrected back to the original, what would be considered wild type. And so in this case, the protein again, works perfectly fine. We can also talk about what's called a nonsense mutation. And what this does is one of the amino acids in the sequence, the mutation has caused it to be a, the codon to be a stop signal rather than an amino acid. And what that means is that as that mRNA is being um, translated, it runs into a stop signal early in the mRNA, and that protein is incomplete. We don't get all the amino acids that should have been in it. And generally speaking, this is usually very detrimental to the cell, meaning that it's a, it's a protein that likely can't function. We can also get what's called a missense mutation. And in this case, it's only affecting one amino acid. So the mutation at the codon so the mutation in the DNA that leads to a mutation in the codon means that the wrong amino acid is added in this long polypeptide. So only one amino acid in that entire protein is different. And in general, we think this could be either detrimental or it could be helpful or neutral. These are small changes um, that might affect the, the function of the protein. And then the last one that we talked to, we want to talk about, which is the one that I was going over on the whiteboard is what we call a frame shift mutation. And we generally think of these as the most um, damaging to a cell. And what we want to think about is what maybe the original message was. And here it's showing you that um, if, instead of looking at it as A's, T's, C's, and G's, we're looking at it as letters. So in this case, it's, it has these letters, which if we break it into those three letter chunks, like we would, um, the nucleotides, we would get the boy ran for the toy, right? We're breaking it up every three letters, we can break those into those codons. But if we did an insertion in the middle of this, we still would get the first part of this, the boy, but you can see that everything downstream, meaning to the right of where that mutation happened, is thrown off by a frame shift. The, fra the reading frame has changed and it no longer makes sense. You can imagine then that maybe these first two amino acids were what were supposed to start the protein, but everything else downstream is a different amino acid. And likely that particular protein would not be functional because so much of it would be changed um, down the line. So how do these come about? So when we think of mutations, how do we think of mutations occurring? And the most common way that we see them happening is what we call a spontaneous mutation. And this is just naturally occurring during DNA replication. So we covered DNA replication early on in the chapter, right? Where we had the unzipping of the DNA and we had the lagging and leading strand and we made these new daughter strands um, that were with the parental strands. There can be errors. It's, it's not common, right? Because um, we know that there's really good uh, editing and kind of really good matching of those bases. But when we think of all of the millions to billions of number of nucleotides that are being replicated, there obviously can be um, errors that happen in that. And when those errors happen, those can be passed on to organisms um, down the line, even through cell division or through sex asexual reproduction, like binary fission and bacteria. We refer to any of those cells that carry a mutation as a mutant strain because it is different than what we would refer to as wild type. Wild type is what is the predominant um, strain in the population. And so those are the non-mutated cells. So this is spontaneous mutations. And these occur, as I said, during DNA replication that those can happen. But we can also get mutations that can happen um, that are caused by external influences. And these are what we call mutagens. A mutagen is any chemical, physical, or biological agent that will increase the rate of mutation, meaning that they make, during DNA replication, there is more likely to be a mutation. We have special kinds of those that we call carcinogens. Um, these are mutagens, but the rate of mutation that they um, 
that they increase actually promotes the de development of cancer. It causes uncontrolled cell growth, these carcinogens do. So I wanna just briefly talk about the different types of mutagens that we could see that could cause um, damage to DNA and could actually um, cause these mutations. The first group that probably most of you are familiar with are chemical mutagens. These can be either organic or inorganic agents that actually cause damage to DNA, um, whether it breaks the DNA, it modifies a base, or actually promotes those frame shift mutations that we talked about. And that's often chemicals that we already know are dangerous to us, especially in high levels. So things like arsenic, asbestos, um, alcohol, and then many of the different compounds that are found in tobacco smoke. These all have the ability to damage our DNA and cause mutations. You also are probably familiar with some physical mutagens that we know can damage DNA. Um, some of those would be UV light, so sunlight, right? Lots and lots of UV light can damage and, and cause mutations in our DNA, which ultimately can lead to cancer. That's true with X-ray and also radioactive gamma rays. And then the last group that maybe you don't think of as much, um, but there are some examples that are fairly commonly known are these biological mute mutagens. And these ones introduce this genetic mutation by having their genetic material kind of combine with ours. And in some ways it'll cause damage to our DNA. So there are certain viruses that can do this. And um, so hopefully most of you are familiar with um, at least the understanding of human papillomavirus, which is a sexually transmitted infection. Um, human papillomavirus is known to increase the risk of um, cervical cancer in women and penile cancer in men. And that's because it has this ability to get in and cause mutations to the DNA in the cells that it infects. Um, transposons are just these, um, what we call jumping genes, these genes in our genome that can move about and they sometimes can do this as well. So again, if we kind of go back and I'll, I'll go to the whiteboard and kind of remind you of this, um, when we think of mutagens or mutations, again, so thinking of mutations, we can think of um, kind of two different types of mutations or, or two different ways this can happen. And the first is what we call spontaneous. And that would be um, an error during DNA replication. Oops, replication, I almost forgot the L there. And then the other kind that we can have is these mutagens, right? These are either chemical, physical, physical, or biological influences that damage DNA. Okay, so those are, are what can cause, right? This is where mutations can come from, how we can get mutations. So I'll jump us back. The nice thing is though, is that our body and, and most organisms have ways to deal with this when this happens. Um, now this isn't going to solve a problem if it's a huge mutation, some sort of major mutation or widespread, but we do have the ability to, um, kind of fix this or repair um, mutations. So for example, when we have DNA replication, we have DNA polymerases that can proofread the DNA and hopefully detect errors. They don't always correct all errors, but they correct a lot of them. And so if you think of DNA polymerase one, um, it actually makes it so that we really only have an error in about one in every 10 billion base pair. So we don't get them very often just due to the fact that we have enzymes that can actually um, they can actually correct those errors. Um, we also have a really cool thing called an excision repair. And I like to think of these as kind of um, enzymes that can come in and cut out a piece of DNA, just a few nucleotides, and then lay down new nucleotides that aren't damaged. And so in this case, this can either fix damaged or mismatched nucleotides. It'll cut out a little piece of the DNA, the single st one strand of it, and then using the other strand as a template, we'll go in and repair it using DNA polymerase one. Um, again, ligase will come in and glue that together. And there, here's a nice picture and an example of where this might be used. 
So one of the things that we know, if this is our double-stranded DNA here, sunlight, which has UV radiation, can damage our DNA. When it gets into our cells, what it can do is it can kind of pop open our double-stranded DNA where we have adenines, two adenines on one strand and paired to them two thymines. When it gets hit by this UV ray, the thymines actually break that bond with the adenine and they pair up with each other. And it's called a thymine dimer. And this puts a little like bubble in the double-stranded DNA that kind of sticks out. The nice thing is, is that our body or our cells have this ability to come in and cut out this little bubble and utilizing that parent strand that is still okay, the two adenine can come in and lay down the bases that match back up and repair that. Please note though, that if this was a big area of the DNA, it's unlikely that it could come in and do this. This is really just very small um, mutations that it can come in and fix. So we have a quick checking in. This is something that I would recommend that you can pause the video now, um, see if you can answer the questions here. I'll give it about 10 seconds to let you pause it before I walk through um, what the answer is for these. So if you pause this, then I am going to give the answers to the checking in. All right, so to go over the checking in, the first question is asking, what is a mutation? A mutation is any change to this DNA sequence in a cell. So any change to that DNA sequence to a cell. Um, which do we see as harmless? So which of those mutations would be harmless? There's two that we think of as harmless, meaning we know that it's not going to hurt the cell or organism, and that would be either a silent mutation or a reversion mutation. Right, so either a silent where the protein remains the same or reversion where it reverts back to that wild type. And then the next question is which are most likely to be harmful? And the two that are most likely to be harmful are the nonsense, the one that puts a stop code on early on in the sequence and a frame shift where the whole reading frame would be affected. And then the last, questions, last question is, are mutations good or bad? And I would argue that mutations could be either, right? Some could be good. That's how we get variation. That's how we get um, kind of evolution. But many of them, and as a matter of fact, most of them are likely to be bad. So that's the end of this particular part. The last part we're gonna get into is talking a little bit about um, how bacteria can get genetic variability since they don't do uh, sexual reproduction, they just do binary fission. We wanna talk about how they can increase um, their genetic um, very variation. So we're gonna talk about the idea that without sexual reproduction, bacteria have several ways in which they can actually get genetic variation within their um, generation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about plasmids. Hopefully you remember early on, we talked about in the genome that um, bacteria have a circular chromosome, but they also can have a little extra um, genetic information called plasmids that often give them some sort of extra benefit or extra advantage over um, other bacteria. Perhaps it's antibiotic resistance or the ability to break down um, some sort of a substrate. And we're going to talk about the difference between what we call horizontal and vertical gene transfer. And then lastly, we're going to go through um, the different types of what we call horizontal gene transfer, talking about um, conjugation, transformation and transduction, which are all ways that a bacteria can get recombination or new genetic information added to what it originally had. And so with that, I want to start out with that idea of what is vertical versus horizontal. And I'm going to go to the whiteboard really quickly to, to kind of give you some idea. So this is the last part of chapter five, but we're going to talk about genetic variation. And hopefully you guys remember how bacteria reproduce. So if we have a bacterial cell and it has its chromosome, it just goes through binary fission and it makes kind of two identical daughter cells. It made a copy of its chromosome and it put them into each of its daughter cells, right? And this is what we would call 
vertical gene transfer. And the vertical is referring to the generations, right? This is kind of the parent. And then it transfers genetic information to the daughter cells, right? So that's vertical. It's from one generation to another. So this is kind of one of our terms, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over something that we haven't talked about yet, which is called horizontal gene transfer. And so this isn't from one generation to another, rather it's a bacteria in its lifetime picking up new genetic information. And we're going to see that that is through three different methods. Um, we'll go through each of these um, in just a minute. I'll do it at the whiteboard and then probably head back to um, the PowerPoint to review it. So when we go back and we talk about this, vertical gene transfer, as I said, occurs when cells pass their genetic information to the next generation. And that can either be through sexual reproduction, if we think of organisms that can do sexual reproduction, or in the case of bacteria through asexual cell division, which is binary fission. But what we're gonna start talking about now is the fact that bacteria have this amazing ability in their lifetime as a bacterial cell, where they can receive genetic information from another bacteria, bacterial cell that is different than from how they got it when they were made. And we have three types. We have something called conjugation, we have transformation and we have transduction. And please note that all of these, um, there is a great video in um, this week's unit. Um, it's a TED talk that he does a very funny way of explaining this. I'll go through it, but I don't think I'm quite as funny as he is. But I'll go through how if I am a bacterial cell hanging out somewhere, what are some ways I could pick up some new genetic information that would give me an advantage? And so the first type that I'm going to talk about is what is called conjugation. So first I'm going to draw what happens and I'm going to tell you this is direct gene transfer. And I'm going to draw out what happens and then I'll, I'll kind of give you the funny way that he explains what this is. So maybe there's a bacterial cell and it has its circular chromosome. So this is its chromosome, but this particular bacterial cell also has a plasmid. And this plasmid has some non-essential genetic information, but some genetic information that might be helpful. Maybe it has antibiotic resistance, and maybe it has the gene for how to make a pillus. And a pillus, if you guys don't remember, is kind of that extracellular appendage that lets it attach itself to another bacterial cell and pass on genetic information. And so I'm gonna call this guy on the left here, this guy is our donor. And maybe he runs into another bacterial cell. Maybe this is in your gut or maybe this is in the soil outside. It's just hanging out and he doesn't have the plasmid. This guy though is going to be called the recipient. And the really cool thing is that donor cell, because it had that gene to make a pillus, he can make a pillus, which is like a little straw that he attaches to the other bacterial cell. And he can also make another plasmid and give it to the other guy. So now the recipient has the ability now to be maybe drug resistant and to draw to be able to make a pillus. And so in this case, it's that attachment and the passing of this and a copy of this plasmid that the recipient now has characteristics that it did not have before this conjugation. So I always refer to this as a conjugal visit. This is as close to sex as bacteria get. But in the video, I love the way he calls it. He calls this making whoopee. And so kind of the way that he says this is if we were to think of ourselves as bacterial cells is maybe I have blue eyes and then I have sex with somebody who has brown eyes. And because of that, I actually now have brown eyes. So that's kind of the first way that bacteria have this ability to vary their genetic information. So that's conjugation, the making whoopee or conjugal visit. The second way that bacteria can pick up genetic information is through something called transformation. And in this case, this is what we would call indirect, meaning that it's not from two living cells. That's not between two living cells. But again, we're gonna have a bacterial cell here. 
and it has some genetic information. And maybe next to this bacterial cell, there's another bacterial cell just kind of hanging out, which has its own genetic information. And something happens to this first one and it dies, okay? And it ends up releasing then its genetic information, right? This is all of that DNA kind of going out in little bits, it breaks up into the environment. And this other bacterial cell has the ability to get this genetic information and bring it in. And it can add that to its genetic makeup. This then gives this, again, we have kind of this donor cell and the recipient because it's receiving new genetic information that might give it an advantage. Now, in this case, the way that he referred to this was this was called a funeral grab. So in that case, you can think of the same thing. I have my blue eyes, right? And I go to a funeral and the person who is there has brown eyes and I gobble up and eat those brown eyes. And now I get to have the brown eyes. I don't really do that. Hopefully you know that, but that is what bacteria can do, right? This is transformation. They can actually pick up genetic material that is in the environment. And if they're capable of doing this, they're called competent cells. So this would be competent cells. It means can absorb genetic material from the environment. And we can actually make cells become competent in the lab by hot and cold shocking them and with chemicals, and we can actually get them to bring up genetic information. Um, we can get them to, to pull in genetic information genes. Um, for example, we can get them to pick up a gene called um, p glow that when we treat them and um, get them to bring it up, it makes them glow fluorescently and we can see that. So that's a kind of cool thing to do. So, so far we had that conjugation, which was where basically the, the making whoopee between two bacterial cells. We had the transformation, which meant that this guy kind of scavenges around and finds DNA that was left from a dead bacterial cell. And then the last one we have, which can be somewhat confusing because we haven't started talking about viruses yet, but in this case, this one is called transduction. And this one involves a virus that can transmit genetic information. So you may not know it, but bacteria can be infected with viruses. So I'm gonna draw a big bacterial cell that has its genetic information. And when bacteria get infected, they, get, they can be infected by a virus. Viruses that infect them are called bacteriophages. And they kind of look like spaceships and they carry their own genetic information inside of them. And when they attach themselves to a bacterial cell, and here I'll put this down, this is a bacteria. And up above it, this is a, what is called a bacteriophage or a virus that infects bacteria. And when they, attach themselves to it, what they do is they will inject that genetic information into the cell and they'll basically take that cell over and get that bacterial cell to make thousands to hundreds of thousands of copies of that little bacteriophage. And so what you'll get is you'll get coming out of this a whole bunch of bacteriophage that are made when they're in this cell that are gonna go out and infect other ones. But sometimes what happens is that some of the bacteriophage that they make accidentally pick up the bacteria DNA. So this is DNA in here and package it instead. And so you might have another bacterial cell. Again, this is the donor and this is the recipient. And this other bacterial cell is just hanging out over here. And maybe this guy goes over to infect it. So it does the same thing. It's gonna attach itself to the surface. Oops, I don't wanna draw that color of DNA and say, but instead of having bacterial or bacteriophage DNA, it brought over bacteria DNA and it injected it in. And in that video that I said that you should watch that TED talk, his funny way of thinking about this is he calls this catching a cold. So back to my analogy of me, I have blue eyes. 
I'm around somebody who has brown eyes and they sneeze on me and I catch their cold. And by catching their cold, I now have blue eyes, or excuse me, brown eyes. So this is indirect in that it's not a living bacterial cell directly giving it to another living one, but it is um, that transmission or horizontal gene transfer. Um, if this is confusing to you, please go back and watch the video, the TED Talk video. But these are all the ways that these bacteria that were the recipients, all of a sudden in their lifetime, can pick up genetic information that maybe gives them an advantage. And so with that, what I want to do is I'm going to jump us back to the PowerPoint. Um, and we're going to review each of these in probably a little bit prettier figures. So the first one that I talked about was the conjugation. And conjugation in this case requires what is called a fertility plasmid. It means that the plasmid can allow the bacterial cell to make a pillus. Remember the pillus is that straw-like structure that will attach it to another bacterial cell and allow that transferred copy of the plasmid into that cell that didn't have it. We can have what is called a high frequency one um, where that Plasmid actually becomes part of the chromosome, but it doesn't always have to do that. And so kind of a picture to show you how this happens. This is one bacterial cell and it has made this pillus that has attached and then it can send genetic information over to the other one. Remember, we think of this as that conjugal visit between those two bacterial cells. So this is showing kind of a much prettier picture than I showed. Um, we have our bacteria here and he has the normal bacterial chromosome and that plasmid that has the gene to make a pillus. We have the recipient um, bacterial cell that just has a normal chromosome. This donor cell can make a copy of the plasmid and pass it through the pillus over to the donor cell. And now this one has that genetic information as well. Now, sometimes they can do this, what's called a high frequency um, strain, meaning that that's not actually in a plasmid, it's just a part of the chromosome. And in this case, the entire chromosome can be copied and passed over to the new cell. But in both of these cases, it's direct communication between two living cells and the transfer of genetic information from one to the other. So that's conjugation, the making whoopee. The next one is what it was called transformation. And remember, this one's the one that we call the funeral grab. In this case, a bacteria will pick up DNA that has been um, disposed of in the environment. There is no pillus involved. It's basically just pulling in or absorbing some DNA that's outside the cell. And those cells that have the ability to do this are what we call confident cells. And so that funeral grab, right? Grabbing it from dead cells. The last one was what we call transduction. And this is where that new genetic material comes from that bacteriophage or that virus that brings material from one bacteria to another bacterial cell. So once it infects that bacterial cell, it can that phage DNA can either direct that new phage particles or it can integrate into the host cell genome. And we're gonna talk about that more in chapter six. But what you really wanna think about is that once it infects that bacterial cell, it's gonna make lots and lots of copies that can go on to infect other cells. And in some cases, what will happen is it will pick up the bacterial DNA. And so this kind of shows how this happens. As I said, this bacteriophage, the virus lands on the bacterial cell and injects its genetic information. That genetic information orders the bacterial cell then to make a whole bunch of these new bacteriophage kind of spaceships but by accident, it puts the host DNA in one of these. These other ones can go on and infect other cells, but this one, if it goes, instead of putting in the viral DNA, it puts in bacterial DNA, which gives this new recipient cell some new genetic information. And likely that would help it um, in some way. It would give it some sort of um, beneficial characteristic. Just a quick little um, guide. This is from your book of a quick way to remember these different things. Thinking about transcription, that that's taking DNA to RNA, they're just transcribing. Translating, the ribosomes are actually translating the mRNA into a protein. We can think about transformation of genes that are transformed, right? Going from one, per, one bacterial cell to another. And then transduction, that idea of genes being kidnapped by a bacteriophage and bring, being brought to a new cell. 
So that is the end of chapter five. We have a quick checking in. Again, please pause the video here. I'll give it about 10 seconds before I go over the answers to give you a chance to pause it. And then we'll uh, get started on chapter six. Okay, for the last checking in, for chapter five, the first question was, name the three ways that bacteria can transfer genes horizontally. So we have conjugation, which is that making whoopee. We have transformation, which was the funeral grab. And then we have transduction, which is the catching a cold. The second question asks, which way requires a pellis? And that's always gonna be conjugation. Um, or making whoopee. And then the last question, what is the vector required for transduction? So what is the vehicle by which the genetic information is transferred in transduction? And that's going to be a bacteriophage, right? A virus that infects bacteria. So that ends chapter five. Um, I will be making available the chapter five Kahoot if you wanna review that on your own time. Remember, if you want to go do that, put up what you need to do. So for the Kahoot, so Kahoot, you just go to kahoot.com. If you haven't already made an account, you make a free account. And then you can search under my full name, all lowercase. And I will have chapter five and chapter six Kahoots up um, because we should be able to complete both of those chapters um, in my recorded lectures. But you are welcome to look at chapter five and chapter six and play the game. Play it against somebody in your house and, and you'll have a really good shot at winning if they don't know much about microbiology. So with that, that ends chapter five. We still have in this recorded lecture um, just over a half hour to get a good start on chapter six. Um, chapter six to me is um, very timely right now since we are in the midst of a viral pandemic because in this chapter, um, we are looking at viruses and prions. And so with that, um, I am going to um, get started talking about viruses. We're going to talk about what they look like, um, how they are different from um, bacterial cells. And one of the first things that I want to do before we even get into here is do a quick review of something we talked about early on in um, the semester. And that was where I talked about the idea that living things are made up of cells. And hopefully you guys remember the five characteristics of cells. I'm gonna put them up here. Normally I'd make you, but you can pause it if you wanna see if you can remember them all. But what we have is we would have DNA as a commonality. We would have ribosomes. We would have a cell membrane. We would have the cytoplasm and we would have cytoskeleton. And then we divided the cells into two big groups, right? We had our prokaryotes and we had our eukaryotes, right? And then we even divided these further, right? We said, gee, there seemed to be um, the archaea, and the bacteria. And the ones we really cared about with eukaryotes was we talked about maybe the helminths, the fungi, and the protists. Okay. And all of these, every single one of these things that I've put up here is of cellular basis, meaning that the basic unit for all of these are cells. And hopefully you remember that I put a little starred section up above it and said, there are some things that we study in microbiology that are not cells. And those are viruses and something called prions. And this is what we're gonna be studying now. This is chapter six. And the reason why they don't fall into this um, concept map is that they don't have things like cell membranes or ribosomes or cytoplasm or cytoskeleton. Some viruses might have DNA, but that's it. That's the only thing that they have in common with cells. And so that's what I want you to kind of keep in mind. These are kind of outside of that. And these are what we would call acellular, meaning they're not cellular, acellular 
microbes. So they're not made up of cells. So we're going to go back to the whiteboard or back to the PowerPoint and get started on this chapter. So virology is just the term that means the study of viruses. This is what I spent my graduate work doing was working in virology. Viruses are even smaller than bacteria. We call them submicroscopic infectious agents. Um, we would not be able to see them with the type of microscopes that you guys are using in the lab. We would have to have an electron microscope to look at these. They are what we call acellular, meaning that they are not made up of cells. And one of the most important things of them is what we term them as an obligate intracellular pathogen. So let's break that down. Pathogen meaning it does damage to whatever it infects. Intracellular means that it is found inside the cell of whatever host it's infecting. So it can't really do anything unless it's inside of a host cell. And the obligate means it needs to be inside of a host cell. So for example, something like the coronavirus, if somebody coughs all over the table and they had coronavirus, if they had SARS-CoV-2 and um, nobody touched it, nobody did anything with it, those virus particles that are on that table do not have the ability to replicate. They can't make more virus particles unless they're in the cells of a host. And that's actually how they make new copies. And we'll talk about that in this chapter. Right now, there are about 5,000 mammal infecting species that have been described. Of those, about 220 infect humans. But we estimate that there are hundreds of thousands of viruses that still are not characterized. And hopefully, if nothing else in the last two years, you've realized that there can be viruses that we have not yet had contact with or been able to characterize that could cause big problems to us. Um, and one of the key points to that is that 70% of all the viruses that infect humans tend to be found in animals other than humans. And that's really the thought with the coronavirus is that likely it was harbored in another animal. Bats are the um, most likely suspect. So one of the things I wanted to go over, I know this table looks busy, but please note that everything on the right hand side of this is stuff we've already covered. This is kind of chapter three and chapter four. But I want you to think about kind of some of these questions that you likely could answer um, for prokaryotes and eukaryotes and kind of the differences that we would see with viruses. So the first one is, are they made up of cells? Viruses are not, that's what differentiates them. Are they considered alive? And the answer is no. We refer to viruses as either active or inactive, meaning do they have the ability to replicate in a host cell or not? Um, and so the key to think about here is that they can't replicate without being inside of a host. The relative size, as I said, they're smaller than prokaryotes and most would require electron microscopy, which are special microscopes. Filterable, what this means is, can they make it through most filters? Like, could they make it through if we're filtering things? And, and for the most part, Depending on, we can get filters that are small enough to filter out viruses, but most filters that are used um, uh, don't filter out viruses. The structure, and this is one thing that I'm going to uh, quickly go to the whiteboard because I find viruses to be incredibly elegant um, microorganisms. I'm a little biased because this is what I studied. But the basic structure that you would find in all viruses is really just two parts. Now I always draw it kind of as kind of this hexagon. And so this is what we call a capsid, which is a protein shell that goes around genetic information, genetic material. And Viruses are really interesting in that we said that in all cells, there has to be DNA, right? That's a key component. Viruses are kind of funny in that they could either have DNA or RNA. So some viruses like influenza and SARS-CoV-2 are called RNA viruses because the genetic material that they carry is always RNA. And then some viruses like the measles carry DNA. 
Um, and so those are DNA viruses. Um, but that's the basic structure. It's basically just genetic information enclosed in this protein structure, which is a really, to me, cool. Um, I know it doesn't sound so cool when we think about the disease they cause, but in my mind, the idea that such a simple structure could cause such um, disease is quite remarkable. So with that, I'm gonna jump us back and we're gonna start going through kind of some of these slides. So as I said, this genetic composition is that DNA or RNA. Um, and in replication, they actually have to utilize the energy and the different machinery of the host cell that they're living in to replicate. So they use the enzymes in the host cell, they use the ribosomes in the host cell, to actually make that host cell become a factory for making viruses. Um, the next question is, do they exhibit metabolism? That just means, do they need nutrients to survive? And they don't. They don't um, metabolize like sugar or anything else, like all cells do. They utilize the energy that the cell has. And then, as I said, that genome composition, it can be either DNA or RNA. So we're going to start walking through, we're going to start out talking about the structure of um, viruses. And then we're going to talk about kind of their genetic material, how it goes about making new virus particles. So just to kind of go through some of the, the vocabulary, I talked briefly about the capsid. Remember, I said that that's that protein shell that packages and protects the viral genome. It's the majority of what the virion is made up of. And it does have these subunits that are called capsomeres. So if I was to go back to my drawing, I might want to kind of re-show this in the idea that each, each of these sides would be called a capsomere. And the all of the capsomeres together form a capsid. You know, the capsid is made up of all of these proteins, these capsomeres that have come together to form the shell. So that's kind of thinking about that. There are these, all the sides of that are called capsomeres. And altogether, they're called the capsid. So one of the things that we want to think about is that with animal viruses, and in this chapter, we're going to talk about two different types of viruses. We're going to talk about those viruses that infect um, animals and, and especially humans, but we're also going to talk about viruses that infect bacteria. And we, we covered that briefly at the end of chapter five, just a few minutes ago. And those were the bacteriophages. And most animal viruses fall into two kind of um, structures, two different ways that they look. Um, they can be what are called helical capsids. So the capsid kind of forms this long hollow tube and inside of that is the genome. And then others of them can look like what is called an icosahedral capsid. And that's kind of what I always drop is kind of that six-sided um, geometrical figure. Um, anything that doesn't look like those two is what we call a complex capsid, and that would be those bacteriophages. So I'm gonna show you pictures of what these look like. So a helical capsid would be this kind of long tube made up of all these capsomeres. And inside of it would be the DNA or RNA of that given virus. So basically all it is is that capsule with genetic information inside. This is kind of a 3D version of what I showed you guys, which is the icosahedral capsid. Again, the capsid is the total structure, the total shell. The capsomeres are the individual proteins that make it up. And then in purple, it's showing either the DNA or RNA inside of that virus. So this is just their general structure. Hopefully you see how simple they are, right? We're not talking about ribosomes or vacuoles or mitochondria or something. They are just genetic information, either DNA and RNA surrounded by a protein capsule. Now the bacteriophage are just slightly different. They still have that capsid structure and they have an icosahedral structure to them, but they have some other um, complex structures because they don't actually enter the bacterial cell. Remember I showed it like a spaceship landing and they inject their genome. So they look a little different. And I think they're one of the coolest looking um, microbes. Um, please note, you don't have to memorize all the different parts to this, excuse me, but you, you should kind of be able to, to see how this differs from just an animal virus. So in this case, it has the capsid up here made up of all those little capsomere proteins. 
It has its genetic information, the viral genome within that capsid, but it has kind of this landing gear and this um, machinery that allows it to take the genome when it lands on a bacteria, bacterial cell and inject just the genome into the cell. So through the cell wall and the cell membrane of the bacterial cell, it can actually inject that in. And we're gonna spend some time talking about how then it can go ahead and replicate in a bacterial cell. So keeping in mind, and I'll go back to the whiteboard just to keep this in mind. Um, we can think about, so viral, structure, and we can think about animal viruses, and they have either helical, so you can kind of picture it as kind of a tube, right? And so this would be the capsid, and then inside of that, is the genome. And then the second type that we can see of animal viruses is what we called icosahedral. And in this case, I do kind of my two-dimensional, sorry, that's the capsid. And inside of that is the genome. But we also were talking about bacteriophages. Remember, these are viruses that infect bacteria. And these ones look a little bit different, right? So they still have that icosahedral shape. And they have the genome and the capsid, but they're a complex, meaning that they have kind of this part that can allow a kind of part that can allow that genome to be injected and then kind of that landing gear that allows them to stick onto a bacterial cell. So I think these are really, really cool, um, very elegant, but this is really the viral structure that we're, we're gonna expect you guys to know. So with that, we're going to jump back and talk a little bit more about some of the other structures that we might see with a virus, but these are really the basic, right? It has that, that capsule that it protects its um, genetic information or genome, um, and that's basically the main components of a viral particle. So as we start to go through this, we can also talk about the fact that viruses can have spikes and most of them do. And when I've drawn the um, SARS-CoV-2 for you guys, I've always put on the spikes because we know it has spikes. And spikes are kind of these little um, extracellular structures that stick out from the virus. And this is showing an adenovirus with one of them. Um, this one is showing one on a herpes virus. And we're also seeing it even on one of those helical capsids. Um, we're seeing it with the Ebola virus. Um, and these can either protrude from that viral capsid or something called an envelope. And we haven't talked about an envelope, but I will be talking about that. Um, and these are sugar proteins that stick out on the virus. And remember, these were kind of like um, a key. And by attaching to a receptor on a host cell, they basically unlock their way into the host cell. So hopefully right now you're seeing that there's a couple of differences between what is called a naked icosahedral. So it's just the capsid with the spikes and the genome inside. And then we have something called an envelope. And so we have that capsid and the genetic material inside. And then we have this membrane around the outside that is called an envelope. Some viruses are envelopes. SARS-CoV-2 is an example of one. And what how it gets this envelope is when it leaves a host cell, it actually picks up a little bit of the cell membrane with it and its spikes protrude out of that. The cool thing about enveloped viruses is that they're actually less difficult to kill or inactivate. Kill isn't the right word because they're not alive, but to inactivate because that membrane is made up of lipids. And so soap and water is really good at getting um, at destroying these enveloped um, viruses. Naked ones are a little bit more difficult to destroy. And so in this case, these ones, this one has an enveloped um, 
it's an enveloped virus as well as Ebola. It has its capsid inside, and then it has this envelope that it took as it left a host cell. So two things that viruses can have possible extracellular structures. One is the spikes, right? And the second one is an envelope. And the envelope is only found in animal viruses. And that's because if we go back up here, we know that these um, bacteriophage don't actually enter the cell, so they don't have a membrane on them. And when they um, are released, new ones that are made are released from the cell, they actually um, basically make the bacterial cell explode. So there's no membrane in which to wrap themselves in. So all, I'm gonna write that up here, all bacteriophage are naked, meaning they're not enveloped. Okay, I'm gonna jump us back now and we're gonna walk through a little bit on the envelope that I believe is next. So, oh, no, sorry, we're getting into the genome. This particular part can be confusing to students. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it, but really what I want you to know as we start talking about the genomes of viruses is to understand, it's really important to remember how what we think of as the central dogma of how proteins are made so that we have DNA that then we transcribe into mRNA, which then can be translated into a protein. And we're gonna talk about why understanding that as a foundation helps us understand how viruses can replicate. So this is just showing you a capsid with a DNA or RNA genome inside of it. The really cool thing about viruses is they could either be a DNA virus or depending on the type of virus they are, they're an RNA virus. And in addition, they can have really interesting genomes. They can either be circular or linear, and they can be either a single linear chromosome or it can be segmented, and they can be either double-stranded or single-stranded. Um, the DNA are more often double-stranded and the RNA are more often single-stranded, but that doesn't preclude them from being one or the other. And what I'll say is, a given virus is one of these things. That virus doesn't change. So like um, the coronavirus is a single-stranded RNA virus, and it will always be a single-stranded RNA virus. But across all the viruses that we could run into, these are all the different types of options that we could see for their genomes. So the next slide is gonna be really confusing and overwhelming. So I'm gonna to try to break it down slowly and talk our way through this. Um, at the very top, what I want you to see is it's talking about how we know that proteins are made, kind of the central dogma that we talked about at the start of chapter five, that we have double-stranded DNA in a cell. This then, one of those strands is transcribed into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA goes to a ribosome where we get translation and we get the cellular protein that was coded for by that gene on the cellular genome. That's the basic, right? There's two big steps. We have transcription and we have translation. But what I want you to see is that that can look different depending on what your starting genetic information is. So if you're a double-stranded DNA virus, that's super easy. It looks just like a cellular one. It goes through transcription, we get mRNA, it goes through translation and we get cellular protein. But if you're a single-stranded DNA virus, you have to add a step to here you have to make the complementary DNA strand to make a DNA, double-stranded DNA. And then you do transcription and translation. So if you're single-stranded DNA virus, you actually have to go through an extra step than what cellular, um, than what cells would have to go through. So that's our first one. And I'm gonna put some of this up onto the whiteboard. So, but this, just trying to remember what your starting material is. Um, with RNA viruses, um, they can have single-stranded RNA, and we can have what is called either single-stranded RNA that is positive sense or negative sense. Very confusing, but I'm going to start with the SARS-CoV-2 one, which is a single-stranded RNA positive sense. And what this means is that its genome is the single strand of RNA, 
but the single strand of RNA can also double as an mRNA, meaning that when this infects one of our cells, its genome, its RNA can immediately go to a ribosome and make proteins. It doesn't have to go through transcription, it skips a step. And that's a really cool thing. It means also though that it can be transmitted very quickly or it can be replicated very quickly in our cells. Now, if you were a single stranded RNA that is the negative sense, meaning that you're not able to just go directly into RNA, you actually have to have to synthesize a second strand of RNA that can work as the mRNA. So you have to do transcription and then translation. So it's very similar to what a double-stranded DNA would have to do. And then we get into retroviruses. These are things like HIV, where it comes in as a single-stranded RNA, but rather than going to make the protein right away, it's actually going to make double-stranded DNA and then make, then do transcription and translation. So if you see this, where there's the double-stranded DNA, this means a step was added. We had to add a step um, to that whole process of replicating its DNA. And then the last one is the double-stranded RNA viruses. These work exactly as a double-stranded DNA. They can do transcription and translation. That's super confusing. And I know students really struggle with this. So what I want to do is go to the whiteboard and kind of break this down the way that I see it. And hopefully what you see is that you don't have to memorize every single one of these processes, but just know the ones that are different from kind of the central dogma, that idea of transcription and translation. So anything that doesn't follow this pattern is the ones that you really want to concentrate on. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard and we're going to talk about viral genomes. And I'm going to do that original kind of remind you of normally what we see is we see DNA. We have the step of transcription. where we get mRNA, and then we get the second step of translation, and we get a protein. This is what we think of as kind of that central dogma and how it works in cells. So this is cellular, right? But I wanna talk about the different types of genomes that we could see in a virus. So I'm gonna draw kind of this line through here, and we're gonna talk about now viral. And so the first kind that we can have is we can have, number one is double-stranded DNA. And this one's really easy. It follows exactly like up again. So we have transcription, mRNA, translation, and a protein. So no big change, okay? We can also though have single-stranded DNA. And this one is where we're gonna to have to add a spot. So I'm gonna write that in red. And I'm gonna say it has to go to double-stranded DNA first, and then it can do transcription to mRNA, and it can do translation to a protein. So this one is one that is different, right? So that's a good one to look at. So this is looking at DNA. We also want to look at RNA because we know some of them can have RNA as their genome. So the first of this we can think about as single-stranded RNA, but the positive sense, meaning that it can work directly as mRNA. And I'm gonna show this in green because this one actually gets to skip a step. It can go, it can do translation immediately. It doesn't do transcription and make a protein. So hopefully you see this is an important one to look at too. It actually gets to skip a step. The next one was the single-stranded RNA that is the negative sense, meaning that it's not like mRNA. It can't immediately be translated. And so this one will go through transcription, make that mRNA, go through translation, and make a protein. And that one is 
the same as DNA. It's not any big difference. We have two more to go. One of these is another one that you're going to have to remember. So there's really three that are different from what you guys are used to. And this one is called a retro. Oops. That doesn't go there. It's called a retrovirus. And so this one is, this one has to go through reverse transcription which hopefully think of what transcription is. Transcription is DNA to RNA. So reverse transcription would be from RNA to DNA. And actually I should have done that in red because I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna color it in in red um, because this is showing you that you're adding a step here. And then once we have the DNA, it's quite simple. Again, you're back to the typical transcription to mRNA, translation, and a protein. So this one again is one that we can, maybe I should do these ones in red because it'll remind you that they add a step versus the green one that subtracts a step. And then the very, very last one, sorry, I know this is confusing, is double-stranded RNA. And this one follows the pattern as above, as the normal transcription to mRNA, translation to a protein. And so hopefully you've noticed there's three that stand out as being different from how we learned that proteins are being made, right? There's this guy that has had to add a step there's this one that actually got to skip a step and go faster to making proteins. And this one, again, oops, sorry, ah, that had to add a step, okay? I know that this can be confusing, so spend some time, but really the three that you really need to be looking at are um, those ones that I've, I've squared out in yellow because everything else follows transcription, translation, transcription, translation. These ones are the, the kind of um, outliers of that. With that, I'm gonna move us back. We're pretty much going to be um, finishing up this chapter. Um, I think I have just a couple of minutes to kind of go back and look at that slide again. Um, and then I'll talk about where we're gonna go from there. So again, when you look at this, anything that starts that goes just through transcription and then translation is exactly how you guys have learned everything. And so double-stranded DNA is exactly how you've learned everything. Single-stranded RNA with a negative sense is how you've learned it and that double-stranded RNA. The ones that are the exceptions to the rule are the single-stranded DNA that has to make double-stranded DNA before it can move forward the retrovirus that also has to make DNA before it can move forward. So those two have an extra step. And then that single-stranded RNA of the positive sense gets to skip a step and moves directly into translation. So this is just talking about how that happens, okay? And what I do want you to keep in mind is that viral genomes actually exhibit a very fast rate of genomic change faster than living infectious agents. And there's a number of reasons why this happens. They have an incredibly fast replication time. They make tons and tons of viruses. One cell will turn out thousands to hundreds of thousands of virions, just one cell alone. And RNA genomes, so if you're an RNA virus versus a DNA virus, RNA viruses mutate much quicker because there are no enzymes that can proofread it. We know that DNA polymerases will proofread DNA but because our cells don't make RNA as a genome, we don't have proofreading for it. And so we have much higher mutation rates, especially in RNA viruses like the coronavirus or like influenza than we would in DNA, um, DNA viruses or in cells. Keep in mind that those mutations can have ne neutral, beneficial, or deleterious, meaning harmful effects. And we'll talk more about what mutations um, within viral genomes um, what those can look like as we move forward. Um, we're gonna leave off, I think, on um, this, oops, sorry. Well, jumped around a little bit. 
um, on this one. So this will be my last slide and we'll come back to this one to start um, in my next recorded lecture. We're gonna talk about the fact that viruses can change over time. Sometimes it will lower their infectivity, which means they're called attenuated strains. And we can often use these kind of weakened viruses in vaccines, but often they can make that virus um, they can have a benefit to the virus, whether they escape, help it escape our immune system. Maybe they allow it to infect different hosts than just one species, so from bats to humans. And maybe it lets them infect different tissues rather than just um, respiratory tissue. Maybe it lets them infect other cells, or maybe it makes them more infectious. And we saw that with Omicron. So this is the slide I will pick up with in my next recorded video. Um, hopefully this was helpful. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Alden or to me. You certainly can email me and I will get back to it as soon as I can. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording and I will see you in the next recording. Thanks, you guys.